Today, I'm talking to Ken Andrews. Like everybody I'm talking to, Ken does a lot of stuff. He's probably best known for his work in the rock band Failure, but more behind the scenes, he is a producer. He is a mix engineer. If he needed him to, he probably does mastering. Ken's the type of person I could nerd out with all day on the technical aspects of things and um, learn a lot. My conversation with Ken happened October 22nd, of 2020. Hello. Oh, hey, Mr. Ken. There you are, man. Look at you. Yeah. You got your our all pro setup you got there. I finally figured out how to, um, you know, use my good camera that I've been using for my YouTube channel on Zoom and still record the the good camera man right right into the weeds right into the weeds with everything well i mean this there's I mean, nothing this but- is like <laughs> this is what people are doing to, to yeah. communicate yeah no doubt so, mm-hmm. i mean your stream right now looks amazing by far the best looking zoom thing i've ever seen well, this is, I mean, this is my studio and I've already, it's like lit for doing YouTube. Your studio is lit, Ken. Yeah. It's it's going off. Yeah. I, I mean, not like a, I have three lights. I have a yeah. front light, a back light, and then a light on the stuff in the background. Yeah. It's, it's like all these, all these things that I, uh, I had to remember from college <laughs> about lighting yeah. and exposure and. It's funny you bring up the videos thing because I I'm I'm in the middle of um, and it's funny you're, uh, you contacted me to do this and also it's a funny that you're talking about songwriting because um, I'm dropping a solo EP next week. Oh wow, cool! Yeah, five songs, and I actually did uh, directed a music video for the first song on the EP. Oh man. And so I just went through that whole process of directing a video and how do you get people on board during the pandemic without having like real production meetings where you're sitting in a room and stuff. And what I did was just, I used um, Apple pages and made a pretty detailed like concept you know, treat or treatment, I guess, but with a lot of visuals in it. A lot of like, you know? mood, like mood board stuff, kind of. Mood board. And then the DP that I hired um, uh, to shoot the video turned me on to this um, new resource called Shot Deck. Shot Deck. And Shot Deck. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's basically like a DP driven um, website where you go where they have digitized screen grabs like blu-ray quality 4k screen grabs of hundreds of movies demonstrating and they're all tagged with like you know tons of tags like soft lighting um you know day for night whatever you know just Uh like movie movie terminology but that was really cool because i had an idea for the lighting that i wanted and it only took me like maybe five or ten minutes to find a really good example of it. You just, slipped up like keywords of like, you know, uh, orange teal <laughs> or thriller mm-hmm. or whatever whatever motif you were kind of as a base point to start off with, and then just copied that and put it in pages. I love pages. I don't know why I resisted working in pages. Yeah. It, it, well, because in, I felt like when it first came out, which was a long time ago, it was it was really glitchy and really hard to use and would crash and, and, but now it's, it's pretty smooth. It's pretty, you can just grab anything and just slot it right in there. It does everything I need. I'm not like, I don't even have Microsoft anymore on my computer, uh, any form of it because, because pages can open word documents and yeah. So why, (laughs) why why pay for that? Open Excel. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been working on your own, like a solo release lately, an EP yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I started writing it, I wasn't sure what it was going to be for. Um, 
and then you know I just got further and further. I was just feeling really inspired. You know, I hadn't done any of my own like solo type stuff for a long time, and so I was just really having fun. And um, then failure actually got together in August and did um, like a write, like a three week writing sort of sessions, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized like these the failure doesn't even need these songs. Like we're we're generating enough good stuff. And, you know, failures be kind of kind of become this thing where like we do actually really think about how we're gonna play the songs live. And so there's, you know, some limitations that we impose on ourselves when we're recording um, to, to do that. And with the solo stuff, I just threw that all out the window. There's tons of synths everywhere, or lots of double, uh, lots of two different guitar parts at the same time. And uh -huh. so, so yeah, I just decided, you know what, this is really just, this would be better as a, as a solo thing. I'm curious, I'm curious what those live restrictions are that you set on failure, mm -hmm. because I think you're, you're probably like the most accomplished person in solving the creative to crossing the creative to technical blood barrier there blood b brain yeah. barrier there like i mean if they're if you're bumping up into stuff you think well i don't know if we should do this because it might be tricky live then it must be like really tricky <laughs> it is well i mean when you, i think anytime you have two or three melodic elements being played by different instruments it's like when you're a three-piece Okay. It's just not going to, you know what I mean? Like if you have a rhythm guitar part, a melodic guitar part, a melodic keyboard part, done. You, you, I mean, like right there, you're just, if you want them all happening at the same time, uh, or if they need to happen, I mean, a lot of times you can kind of jettison one of those. What's the most important thing for a live for like a focus. I always, I always kind of sure. look at like, I'm a pretty, I'm a maximalist most of the time when it comes to like, um, what's fair game to put into a recording session for a song. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but there is, but there has to be like some kind of my, my philosophy is there has to be some sort of like, where's the main vocal, like the mm -hmm. main vocal, like it could be most of the time it is the main vocal and you have like your secondary hook and then you have like your rhythm stuff. But, when the main vocal goes away, what's the main vocal? So it's like, you know, what what in, what sort of thing is the focal point that you want people to, or that is most important? And mm -hmm. for when when it comes time to kind of do that um, band meeting of okay, here's this mess of a of a session, how are we going to play this? It usually just comes down to like what's going to be that focal point, as that once the vocals go away, what's that? What takes that place? And once the vocals go away, meaning once, yeah, if there's sections, if there's a sections section of the song without lead vocal, yeah, where it's, where it's instrumental, yeah. like what's going to be the, what's going to be the, um, what's the point of that section? What's going to be mm -hmm. the, uh, undisputed hook and what's going to be the undisputed, like secondary thing that's cool, but not quite as important to focus on. And then we kind of like make our hard decisions off of that as like what, if there is like three melodic guitar lines running and keyboards and, you know, if there's more than we have hands for, like what, it's not a big deal if one of those things gets the ax, if we kind of narrow it down to like, what's the most important thing. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a tough, it's a tough battle sometimes because there's lots of cool things that people are attached to. Yeah. I mean, like a pad, I can usually let go, you know, um, it's, I mean, for for a failure for live, there's a there's a couple songs that we have figured out how to play live um, since we rebooted in in fourteen um, that we only played live as a four piece in the nineties, and that was basically down to uh, Greg being able to um, walk over to his keyboard in certain sections or sometimes the whole song and play keyboards. But while he's playing um, keyboard, he's playing with his left hand, he's playing bass. Oh, right. Okay. So, for instance, Stuck on You was pretty, you know, basically Troy was, um, yeah, Troy Van Leeuwen was in our 
band in 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 the sort of 96 97 time and he would play the melody of that song um and i would play the the chords the rhythm chords and greg would play bass and kelly would play drums um but all of those four things need to happen at the same time or you just don't have that song right and so he's like well i want to play bass and i'm like yeah well you can't (laughs) and he's like what what about like in the chorus when the melody's not going and i was like yeah i guess you could play you could go from the keyboard to bass and 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 kind of switch back and forth so that's what we're doing now so basically he's there's like three or four switches in the song where he has to go from left hand keyboard bass right hand melody full like bass in a to full bass within a quarter note uh-huh like, you know or eighth note actually um and back and forth so um so we had to get a mute switch going for his bass because he didn't even have time to like roll off the volume uh-huh you know you step on the mute over. hit the keyboards and at the same time within a quarter note hands off keyboards hit the mutant button and land right on the fret that you need to exactly land right on yeah. the fret and don't mess up any of the keyboard notes because yeah. that's a little disorienting sure. for, for me to go from strumming strings to playing plastic keys you're in you're in like a, a level of physicality playing bass and then you have to switch to a completely different instrument with a completely different set of like physicality response like which in a keyboard which is nothing you know maybe velocity to some degree but like and then and then you're back <laughs> and you have to leap back in are, key, there's no forgiveness for a wrong note in a keyboard no <laughs> no for, for making that leap over in in you hit the wrong note on that first note. It's like a bummer, especially for if you're everyone. especially if what you're if what you're leaping to is like the main vocal for that section, like the the melodic yeah. thing you have to start on. Kind of matters on the downbeat if you hit that right note. Mm-hmm. I'm amazed after like doing a little bit more with um, like axe effects and you know programming our own pedals for stuff. Like I, it's it's like the performance of your songs isn't just about like your instrument. It's about like when you hit a certain button, when you like, when you're talking about like, like in some cases, like four things at once, you know, or three things at once, leaving the bass, hitting a mute button, coming on the keyboards, you know, leaving the keyboards, hitting the mute button, landing on the bass. It's like all of this was supposed to make things easier. It's like driving a a computer. You know, you you have to have one part of your brain focused on the musical performance and trying to like imbue that with emotion and and staying in the moment and all of that that you need to be able to do when you're playing live to a live audience. But then you've got all this like show technical stuff that you have to be keeping track of. And it's, it's gotten, yeah, it's gotten out of hand, especially for us, because I mean, a lot of bands, I think, and, and, you know, it's smart for them to do this, um, you know, with the, with the endless amount of presets and scenes that you can have with these amp modelers, a lot of bands choose to just stay on one page of their MIDI controller. And really, they just have like four or five, six sounds. So they approach it going like to. pedal board. Yeah. Instead of like... Which is... Or you go the, you know, down the rabbit hole, which is making a, a preset for each song in your set. And then within that preset, you have six different scenes, yeah, which that's, is what we do. That's my rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's just <laughs> the, the, the deep side. Of, yeah, go. Oh. oh, hey, there's a new firmware for it's this. A lot of work. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> it's oh. it's days and days and days of prep work, organizational work, and then execution work during the song. You know, and I actually, you know, we try to film most of our performances now. Um, just because it's for really easy and cheap to do, and so um, and record them all too. 
uh, right off the, the, the console. So when I go back and like critique those performances or just watch that just to see what's going on, I'm noticing these days that for me, almost all of my mistakes are technical mistakes where I'm missing a pedal hit. You know, I'm missing a, a scene change. Generally, it's a scene change, or I go to the wrong scene. I go I, instead of going up one scene, I go down one scene. Um, and because I'm playing and singing, that's my focus. And you know, the the button pushing it has to take second place. And so, and sometimes you miss, you know, and and you don't hit the right sound. And it, the worst part is when you're going into like a chorus or a louder part and you click the quieter sound. <laughs> <laughs> or, That's or you go, always the worst yeah, part. Or, like, or the worst is it's, it's that or when you go too far and you switch to the acoustic preset and it's just direct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or the, the other one like that happens super to loud me loud and direct. <laughs> yeah, super loud and direct. The other one that happens to me all the time is you go into the solo and you know it's yeah oh it's so cool to go into a radically different sound with like all these different delays on and everything and you're just like in your solo but then you have to go back to the chorus and if you miss that hit and you're still in your crazy solo sound when you go back into the song that tur turns out to be a nightmare yeah, at that point you have to make a decision. Do I ride this out like I meant to do it, and that's just the way it happens all every night? Is this a crazier yeah. sound for this, for, or do I like pick a appropriate place to kind of like switch, maybe like a bar in or halfway through, or <laughs> you know? Well, sometimes the solo sound is so crazy yeah. that it, it, it you have to get rid of it <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah, you just hope whoever's on front of house is picked up on the fact that that is what's going on, and they kind of adjust accordingly. Yeah, and thus, and thus and bring you down like six dB immediately. Right? Yeah, yeah, six dB down. <laughs> you know, and those, you know, it, it, even in those situations, it's probably more of like if you know if you're using in ears, you have such a like a, a microscope on what's happening, and you can pick out those things happening. But somebody in front of house probably just hears the vocals come back in on the, on the chorus and doesn't realize that there's this insane guitar still going because they're focused on other things or, you know, yeah. lighting elements might be changing. It's like, I think we're, we're always so lost in the bubble sometimes that it's a little bit tricky to like, I don't use any crowd mics in ambient mics in my mix. I like the bubble. I want to hear, I want to hear surgical precision of like everything yes. that's going on so I can, mm -hmm know about timing and I don't know I just like getting lost in that when we're playing but I know that's not how people are actually hearing it it's like far from it yeah there's that all that added ambience in in the in the in the room that you're playing in that blurs um especially and and kind of nicely I, I think or forgivingly blurs um like rhythmic problems yeah yeah rhythmic problems because um, I've had I've had a couple I'm not going to say which bands but I've had a couple crazy moments where like I've seen bands play in like big venues and they're and they're playing and you're like yeah sounds sounds pretty cool it's definitely the band it's it sounds good and then I was given like headphones to listen to like the drummer's mix or or the singer's mix and you and you realize oh my god they're not tight at all <laughs> they're like all over or the bassist is like yeah what the heck he's like a half bar off right now um but you can't tell in the room yeah especially the bigger the room it is where we're like if it's an arena forget it like it's just kind of it's got to be really loud for you to pick up on those surgical aspects of it or it really i mean for if you're a rock band it has to be real loud where you can pick up on the surgical aspects of what's really happening in the crowd Mm -hmm. <sighs> or headphones or someone passes you headphones of the mix. But I, but I, I think, I do think that in ears are bet are really good for performance. Like you said, it allows you to zero in. It, it makes you play tighter Yeah, with the drummer for sure. Cause you can hear every little 
thing yeah. that the drummer's doing so you can like lock in with them better. I'm curious about, I'm curious about like, well, I mean, obviously when you're on your own, it's, it's like no, um, there's no consideration of like what somebody else is going to do. Um, the element of, you know, it's, it's kind of all on you. Um, but also there's no, there's, there's way less, uh, restrictions. Like you were saying of how, how am I even going to replicate this? Cause it's really just about chasing the idea. Well, I've, I, I've kind of, I mean, and I'll never say never, but I, I, in, a, in my personal situation right now, I've kind of resigned myself to the fact that I'm don't need to think about how to play these songs live because I don't really want to tour on this EP. I'd I'd rather the the next opening for working on artist stuff for me is going to be continuing to work on the new failure record and then planning hopefully for like a you know 2022 tour or something. I right. don't know. Um, so yeah, if if you're not thinking about touring on something and you're and you're and you're recording a new song, it's really fun because you can do a lot of different, <laughs> yeah, a lot of different things and just kind of follow your bliss. And that's why I felt, or that's why these five songs, even though they're, you know, they're, they sound like pretty full recordings, did it all really quickly, maybe five weeks. Um, soup to nuts, like writing the song and recording it and f mixing it and finishing it. And right. So you're probably a lot like me. Like that's you probably don't leave that that eight foot diameter zone there much <laughs> for for anything really. No. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's like everything the, is just like cockpit. everything is just like you're just like gather. You're just like hunkered down in front of the campfire and mm -hmm. and building stuff there. Like, can you, ima can you, can you imagine a time, can you think back to a time like when you were flushing stuff out that didn't include, you know, building in a, in, 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 in a computer world versus building in a, in a analog or like a jamming world. Mm -hmm. Cause like for me, for me, like building in Pro Tools is writing, you know, like production, thinking about what's possible in, in a computer world is writing like this for me like that's that's there's no separation in the two it's like i can't i don't write stuff on the road anymore like i'll, I'll come up with i'll come up with like scraps of things that i want to develop but i don't do any writing unless i'm sitting in front of the computer with all the toys now mm -hmm. you know what i mean like can you think right. back about when it was when that wasn't an option like what what yeah. writing was like then? well I, there's some we actually someone reposted some footage uh, uh, that, that, that we posted a long time ago, that failure posted a long time ago of Greg and I writing in our, f uh, four track cassette recording bedroom studio in 1993 and what our set and, and the camera kind of pans around and you could see what we were dealing with. We had a pair of NS tens, a cassette four track that had a mixer built into it a dat player a stereo dat player that was pretty high tech yeah that's that's pretty uh, nuts it wasn't like the nice studio panasonic one it was uh -huh. like a portable really <laughs> it, it ate dat tapes all the time actually and we had a a microphone cable going across the the floor of the the bedroom into a closet and it and i even opened the door and you could see there's just a 57 on a Marshall cabinet in the closet with a bunch of blankets and pillows yeah. just stacked in there. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And it worked and it was fun. It was like super cool to like, Hey, let's put a flanger pedal in on this guitar part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, what were you doing with the dat? Was that like your mix down? Like, situation or were you dumping? it was the mix down <laughs> but it was also a bounce situation so we'd fill up four tracks uh-huh which would usually be um mono drum machine mono bass two rhythm guitars oh yeah so right? you bounce so that like to an instrumental mi instrumental stereo mix down with doubled stereo guitars then bring that back onto two tracks and now you got either 
one track for vocals or two track for vocals or one track for vocals and maybe another guitar overdub. Yeah. And if you wanted and then to mix that down to dat and then that would be the final. Yeah, and you could keep doing that pretty much forever by adding two tracks, bouncing it to dat, <laughs> dumping it back to the cassette format. I I I think <laughs> we found that we did try that a few times, but like the the second dat pass never like everything just kind of right collapsed basically i wish i would have thought about something like that i would always like leave one track open for the bounce and then work mono Mm -hmm. you know and then i'd find myself at the rat race of like three tracks bouncing to one then three tracks bouncing to one and then three tracks bouncing to one like just going back and forth between one and four beatles that's how the beatles did it yeah because they didn't have, or at least on some recordings, they didn't have a stereo mix down deck to to bounce to. Right. That's why you hear, like, on those panned releases, you hear, like, drums and bass on one side. Because they were actually combined on a previous, you know, Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Right. For, yeah. I, I get you. But the thing of it is, is the four track recording, the more I look back on that, and the fact that 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 I got involved in, in in you know using a four, cassette four track really really early in my musical development as a songwriter and guitarist um, has in like informed my whole career as a musician. Yeah, I mean, it. I've looked at the recording process, the writing of songs, the writing of riffs, the programming of drums. Um, all of that, that to me is just one process. I don't like s- s- piece it out like, oh, today I'm going to only do this and or, I'm going to put on my guitar player. It's like all happening at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, for better or for worse, I think, I think there's a lot of advantages to that. But then, you know, I prob- probably would be a better guitarist um, if I had not focused so much on recording so early on, um, but you know, it's just what, what floats your boat, I guess, you know, yeah, that's no, what, I, I, hear that's you. what I was into. My guitar playing kind of peaked in eighth grade, I think, <laughs> right when I started, okay. right, okay. right when I started, right when I started getting really into cassette format, four track stuff too. It was like, that was, that was okay. about as good as I'm ever going to get is eighth grade. Wow. I could almost okay. I could almost play the leads on Justice for All and then I and then I got into like recording other bands and <laughs> like, Oh wow. Al- almost. Okay. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't even get close to that. I mean, I could pl- like, play along with the rhythm parts of uh the car songs, you know? Like that was <laughs> as far as I got. I mean, I could I never got uh proficient at like play, playing fast at all the, the the types of people around us back in those days was definitely more like a lot of a lot of downstroke palm mute punk stuff mm-hmm. so we just got fast because that's what we were all listening to i see yeah yeah um i couldn't play that way now if i tried it would take me a month of like like almost like like going to the gym to work out conditioning, you know, <laughs> like set a, set a metronome for 80. Do that for five, do that for five minutes, stretch out, you know, go back in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 82 today. <laughs> yeah. 82 bumping it up. Yeah. Bumping it up. <laughs> so funny, man. Like now, yeah. Now I don't even like, I don't even think that way really. I think once you, once you get into that and you start, you get past the, it's just like, it's just like learning how to play guitar. There's a period where you're the, the physical awkwardness of fretting notes kind of goes away and then you're not really thinking about it anymore. You're, you're thinking Mm -hmm. about what you're thinking about and you're just playing. And I think like, um, um, once you reach that level of, of, proficiency or competency or, or like musicianship now I, I would say with like software recording then it's just not something you think about before you, you don't even think about the fact that you're reaching to run uh, a guitar through like Valhalla <laughs> or you don't you don't think about the fact that you just you know set up a mic and you're slapping a two by four into concrete it's just 
it, it, all of a sudden you just find yourself doing that stuff because like it, it's, it's just a part of like your, it's like a reflex now. You, mm-hmm. You're just, you're just moving your body and your, and your, your creative decisions the way you would fret uh, a note or like the intensity you would dig into a palm mute stroke. It's just, it's kind of the same thing. I think the first year or two when I was getting my, uh, I guess, uh, my proficiency in, in Pro Tools recording, I was still, it was still the time when people would record the tape first, uh-huh. dump it into Pro Tools, edit, and then dump it back to tape. I don't even know why we did that part. I can't even remember. <laughs> but, but like, I remember somewhat a musician watching me cut up some drum stuff and like, move it all around and kind of make a new loop out of it and a musician was standing behind me who i really respected and they were just like okay i get it now i've been really against the whole computer thing but now that i can see what's really happening you're playing that computer like an instrument yeah that's what's happening you're just using it like you're you have a musical idea in your head and you're manipulating the sound in the computer the same way as I would do on, on my bass. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I just look, like I said, I just look at it all as, as one thing. And the only, the only question for me when I'm sitting down, if I'm even sitting down thinking about writing a song is what's going to come first. Right. The order that you're going to, like what what are you thinking about like a lot of times for me it's it's i'll just put on a guitar or a bass and i'll just start messing around and if i happen to land on something that i think is cool like a riff or something i record it and if I, if if i really like it and it grows on me i'll start trying to add other things to it other times i'll come in and i'll have like a drum be idea in my head and i really like i even have an idea for the like drum sounds that i want and i'll start working on that and then all of a sudden i have like a couple different beats and then i'll either grab a guitar or a bass but i try to mix that process up a little bit and not always start on guitar or start on bass or start on keys you yeah know, you have to, to move yeah, I think that helps with the variation of songs and and type of you know the the moods basically that you create. I try to mix it up too, because I think if I landed on something that just worked, I wouldn't be able to replicate that because in my head I'd have the pressure of it working, and that mm-hmm. would be, and that would psych me out. Like, oh man, like the minute you run into any resistance, you'd you'd psych yourself out because wait, this just worked why is it not working now? And then it's off to the races of the downward, uh, uh, resistance spiral. <laughs> yeah. For me, mm-hmm. I like, I like yeah. using a lot of, I like using prompts. Prompts are my, are a big thing for me. Like just some kind what of, do you mean by prompts, any, anything other than like sitting down and saying to myself, what do I want to do now? Like mm-hmm. some kind of basically some way to start that isn't all me. How I can trick mm-hmm. myself into not starting someplace that's just a a present self realized me. I guess like I guess maybe this, how how can I get to my first response quicker um, rather than rather than um, you know I, I guess that's I guess what's I'm, that's what I'm using prompts for is how do I get to my first response. Uh, it's, it, it's like, a, it's like a drum beat sometimes like, a, or like a loop. Maybe, or maybe Zach will send me a loop. You know, he's building, he's always building percussion loops and drum loops and stuff. And I'll just, I'll throw that on and then I'll, you know, see what happens. You know, like you're just writing, writing prompts. Like I'll keep, I won't, I won't necessarily like write lyrics outside of music, but Something something strikes me, and I figure and I linger on it for you know a minute or two. I write it down, or I'll you know make a note of it, and then later on I'll come back to those things, and have that as like a starting place. You know, you know I'll visit it again, and 
I'm I'm not just filling out a blank piece of paper. I'm, I'm responding to something. It's like it's like uh, if you were in a jamming situation, somebody would do something and you force you to respond to it. Like how can I how yeah. can I be that for myself without becoming self aware and and tripping all over myself in the process of it? Is kind of the thing. A I'm lot of times for. for me, the 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 beginning of a song uh, happens from. Um, experimenting with a new piece of equipment mm -hmm. or a new guitar or a new bass <laughs> or new tuning like for instance a new tuning i mean i just got a bass six and you know two of the songs on this ep feature it because as soon as i got it i was just like what the yeah this is awesome this is so weird like what it it sounds different and it like immediately gets your your juices flowing you know um but it doesn't always have to be something that you you buy like so many people i mean even if you have if you just have logic on your computer for two hundred dollars you can it would take a lifetime to go through all of the sounds and <laughs> stuff that just come with free yeah on, with that program um so you know sometimes it'll be like i'll hear a song like one of the things that uh, inspired or, or sort of started one of these new songs for me was hearing a, a U2 song from Unforgettable Fire and just remembering how much I loved that album, just the mood of that album and the, the sound of that album doesn't sound like any of their other records. It's like such a unique you know, moment for them in their recording history. And I was just listening to some of the sounds and I was like, I'm just going to try to get like an edge type sound this morning. Like, I don't know what, what's going to happen Yeah. when I do that. But like that alone, just, just sort of pursuing that one little idea. I'm just going to get a sound that sounds like the edge. I'm not going to learn any U2 songs or anything. I'm just going to like get a sound that's in that vein and just play and all of a sudden you have a riff you know um and so it, it doesn't necessarily have to be like oh i got an actual new pedal although that is a very very good way to write a new song for me yeah to, you know just get one new toy and just start playing with it and it just leads you down those those paths you know where you start to turn off the analytical side and just start to, you know, f go with the flow. Yeah, it's hard for me to turn off the analytical side, especially if I'm working on lyrics for something. Mm -hmm. Like that's the worst. That's literally the worst. It's the it's the most. <laughs> it's a. Re I, I would have so much more material if I was better at like cranking out lyrics for things. And I, I mean, I don't know why. It's like I don't think my lyrics are anything like. You know, no, they're not like. <laughs> 300 level poetry <laughs> writing it's just like you know they're rock yeah. songs they're rock songs they're lyrics for rock songs you know but for for whatever yeah. reason it's it's just like you know i guess it's that, it's that same it's that same sort of self awareness if if you just if you just become aware that like like right now if i become aware that i'm speaking i start thinking about what i'm saying and then, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, Get self -conscious. and then there ends up a lot of long pauses and a lot of pauses between words. And what the hell am I saying right now? Oh my god! Like, <laughs> yeah, it happens a lot when I'm doing like any sort of public speaking thing, and it's really, mm -hmm. it's really, it's a phobia of mine. But like that in writing lyrics happens all the time, and I don't know why. It's like I should, I'm, I'm have headphones on. I'm usually alone. There really is no pressure. I mean, there's all mm -hmm. the pressure, but really there's no pressure. It's not like, you know, nothing is going to really be wrong if I don't nail this right now. But there's that. You know You know what I've done? I have the exact same issue that you're talking about. And what I've learned to do over the, over the years, this is just how it works for me, is that... Um, because it's so easy to get stifled with lyrics like you're talking about 
is I just don't make myself um, finish the lyrics for a long time. So what I do is as soon as I start hearing vocal ideas, I start singing them, recording them. And, ev- and I don't have any lyrics. Right. And what I find is that I, I, if I just kind of mumble words or sounds, um, invariably there'll be a phrase or two in this sort of like improvised a take or, or you know recording where I'll hear it and I'll be like, oh, actually that's kind of a cool phrase. Oh, now it's making me think of this phrase and now it's like starting to give a shape to the song and like maybe what the song could be about. And so, but it's like a process, like that first track might only be in the verse, you know? Yeah. Like I still don't have anything for the chorus. It might just be me just like, "Ah, ah, ah," just going like that, just humming. And then a few days later, when I start to throw in words, just a f- words start popping in your head, and becomes it, it becomes more like an instrument way of looking at it, where you're refining a riff over the course of time. Yeah, and there's less pressure. So by the time the song, musically and instrumentally, is really taken shape, and then the vocals. I'll have some vocals there. I don't, I, I, what I don't do now, and I avoid it like the plague, is com- completing an entire instrumental song without vocals. Because what'll happen is I'll never, for some reason, I'll never be able to hear vocals on it. And I, and I think it's just an instrumental song. So I just kind of force myself to, add something in there and and it evolves over the course so that by the time the song's almost done i have something that's has a lot of cool nuggets in it it has a lot of cool little phrases a word here or there and then and the melody of course right the melody has been taking shape and throughout the throughout the recording process and now oh it's not as daunting to take that and and actually fill out all the the blank spots or just the you know no word spots and just kind of make something that feels good or you know or seems seems right so it's just funny cuz like i have these you know there's playlists in pro tools right so i have like verse takes well verse takes when i'm writing a solo song these days i mean that could be 30 30 takes over the course of yeah because you're like scat writing as you're going yeah you're scat writing and you're like it's cool because you can go back and be like you know i i I followed this idea and now i'm not liking it what if what did i do a few days ago that that part was cool and you can go back and go okay there it is and then you bring that down and you're just kind of always building this it's it's funny it's like you know, we talk about like if you have a song written and all and you know exactly what you're going to do and you go to record it, you'll record a few takes of the vocal and then you'll compile for the best uh, performances of that vocal into one take. Same thing. I'm doing the same thing with the vocal, mm-hmm. but writing. It's not performance. I mean, it is performance kind of, but it's it, you're you're. You're chipping. You're chipping away at the the clay. You know. You're 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 removing stuff. You're adding stuff. And I don't know. That's that. Yeah. It's just a thing that's worked for me recently that I really enjoy. It's really important to at least get a scat vocal of melody and phrasing down as soon as you can. Like that part is essential because you you're right. You'll listen to it again. You'll be stoked on the music and you'll want to listen to it again. And then you'll listen to it again. And all of a sudden, like it's an instrumental song and you can't, that's how you perceive it. Um, yeah. It's, it's like, uh, it's really hard to, if you, if you're that person that made it, it's really hard to back up and back up to get the objectivity again to say, okay, what would be a cool melody over this? Cause like, it's an instrumental song. 
<laughs> so like, yeah, it's yeah, really, it's, the- it's huge. It's hugely important to get as much scat, like melody and phrasing kind of roughly together right away. I might, I might actually comp the scat track. I might like run it. I might just say like, do like three or four takes of just scat vocal and then comp that together and build like a melody and phrasing out of it that way. Um, yeah. But then I think like my totally. problem is my problem is and what I know I might need to do is, okay, you got that. Maybe take a pass at like writing lyrics for it. Maybe you get like, maybe you do hear decipher some of that, that scat as, as like words, you write those words down you see if that leads anywhere. You don't necessarily know what the song is about yet. You're just chasing, you're just trying to describe, you're trying to like academically describe the mood of what you've just done, what you've just divined out of nowhere. You're trying to like describe that with actual words for the lyrics, but maybe you don't get far. And my problem is like, I I want to push through that. And yeah, I, I feel like I need to cut myself off at negative returns earlier Leave all they're still clapping and cut myself off a little bit earlier. So I have some, some sort of like <clears throat> all my, all my momentum momentum isn't just killed by the fact that I can't do it anymore. Like put it mm-hmm. away, put it away. Maybe come back exactly. in two days, three days and like, listen to it again. And then it's like somebody else showing you an idea and asking you for like, Hey man, put some into this. Like it's, it's exciting again. You get you hear that you get that objectivity if you take a break yeah that's that's why exactly why i love doing those scat vocal takes because a lot of times what will happen is i'll be working i'll be like um okay i'm hearing some stuff in my head i just finished a guitar part or a keyboard part i'm hearing some vocal stuff in my head i'll do the scat vocal part i'll do a few takes like you said i'll maybe even comp it and then I'll sit there and I'll be like, I need to get, I need to stop. You know what I mean? Like, I, I should just stop right now. Don't overthink this. Like, stop. Go do something else. Go fold some laundry. And, you know, come back to it the next day when you can barely remember performing those scat vocals. Uh-huh. And you hear them with this fresh objectivity and you immediately go, Oh man, the part I thought was cool when I was laying it down totally sucks. But the other, this weird part at the end is totally cool. I should make that be the main part of the song now. And you shift everything around, you know, like I think ever since our album invented, I really felt like it was important to know what it is I'm talking about. Like earlier, mm-hmm. as a younger person, I didn't care. I was just like, hey, man, here's my record. It's up to you to figure this out. And <laughs> it's like, you know, how yeah. ma- you know how much music is out there now? Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, I love, I love figuring stuff out for myself. But I think as, as a listener, it's much more, I mean, people love story. People love a story. Like, mm-hmm. why, sh- why should I care about your record? I think it was doing press on Invented is when I really got into the idea of like, I should know what I'm talking about here because I'm telling people about our record. Like yeah. what's there to say about, like why even do press unless you have something to say about your record? Right. <laughs> it's my record, man. Yeah, yeah we, you, can talk, you can talk about how you recorded it with, at X studio with X and Y producers, and, but no one cares. <laughs> no one really cares mm-hmm. outside yeah. of like maybe me and you <laughs> and people like us, like right. where you recorded it in, in what producers you worked with. Like they want to hear like, why should I give this album a shot? So I felt it was really important to know that before I started talking to people. And, um, Mm -hmm. now like, you know, three records after that, I have that in the back of my head. So when I'm, when I do, when it is time to decipher the scat vocal and put real words to that, like I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm kind of thinking about that. Like, what is this really Mm -hmm. about? What am I saying here? Like, how am I, honoring the theme of what sparked this thing. What is the spark of this Mm -hmm. thing? What does that really Mm -hmm. mean to me? You know what you're trying to get it to. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a help, but it's also a restriction because when you, when you have ideas for things that lead you off in other directions that away from that thing, like you're, 
you're kind of resistant to that because you want to try to get it to this thing. And that's that's now the weird ju- jumble for me in, in writing lyrics is like, how much do I push toward this idea I thought was cool? And how much do I let it just go wherever wherever it's going to go? I, 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 th- I think I put a little less um, restriction on 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 the meaning of the lyrics to myself when I'm doing it because I've, I've, I've had a lot of experiences now um, where I can look at a song that um, I recorded even years ago and I'll, I'll, I'll remember when I was working on it that it seemed kind of vague to me, but it felt right like lyrically Mm -hmm. it felt right but it seemed a little vague like i didn't but then i'll look back on that song and i'll think about what was going on during that time and i'll be like i know exactly what i was talking about you know yeah i now i know it's like literally now because i have distance i can see what i was i know what i was going through personally during that time and i can see that i was writing about those feelings I, I was having about whatever it was, you know, right. relationship or, or whatever. So I, I more of a little bit more of like, um, trust the inspiration, I guess, or just trust that, that if it sounds good to you there, it's not just because the consonant is working rhythmically a certain way or something like that it's because those words do have a meaning for you you just might not have figured out what they are yet you know what i mean yeah so it's like and then you you might you might re- realize as you're finishing the lyrics for the song oh okay now i'm starting to get the whole picture and the and the lyrics that you don't like that you have can get swapped out for something that that's going to make the song more congruent lyrically um, but no, I've, I've, I've definitely finished whole songs where I like the vocals. I like the lyrics, but I couldn't tell you, like, I couldn't give you a, a, a two sentence, like synopsis of what the, the theme of the song is. Um, and, and sometimes I do get to the point on some songs where I'm like, this is just too vague. Like this is just too. I don't even like. I, I'm not. I, I'm not grabbing any imagery. I'm not grabbing any feeling. Right. These lyrics suck. And either I write better lyrics, or this song is toast. When I when I do get on a roll and I start end up ending up with in that state, like where I have lyrics I like, they're they're flowing, that's fitting, it all works, and then I'm kind of like at a secondary editing stage, where I'm kind of like assessing the general vibe of it and feel of it. Um, I, I, I do think it's, I, I, I run into that same problem too. It's like, um, things feel just too direct. Think, things feel like, I, I think think it's like they're direct, but they're also really vague. It's like, you haven't grounded these things you're saying in any sort of like, like context, yeah, context or like scene setting, you know, in a way, like some of the more abstract things kind of do give it context and, you, you need that, you know, like if you spend maybe a half of, if you spend maybe most of like your first verse, not really getting into much, but just kind of like scene setting or like setting a scene. Yeah. Just imagery. Like you're at least giving it some sort of context to where, yeah. where you can say the direct thing. And it feels like as a listener, you've, you 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 can relate to it more. You can connect to it more. If it's just a whole lot of like first person speaker telling you to do something <laughs> without yeah. any kind of context, it's like well, I don't I don't how 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 am I supposed to like find myself in this as a listener? Yeah, I mean, and so, imagery. I think early earlier in my songwriting, my a lot of my songs had. F- uh, lyrical mood but they didn't have enough imagery and I and I and I still occasionally fall into that trap but now I'm much more focused on that and I find that focusing on that early on imagery and and you know descriptive words 
re- really gives like the context and the shape and leads you to a theme. Yeah, you know, so sometimes the, just describing the the scene ha- helps you discover what you want to write about. Yeah, totally. I think where where am I when I'm listening to this? Like, if I have a musical idea that I'm I'm trying to sort lyrics to, like, where am I when I'm hearing this? Mm-hmm is a huge part of what helps me refine the the lyrics to a place that like <laughs> end up being real words. You know, like what's that look like? Yeah. What, what literally what's it look like when I'm when I'm hearing this? Where am I? What's happening? What does it feel like? Like what are the fi- what what are the five senses that that you're experiencing while you're listening to this and imagining where you are while this song is happening? Like that mm-hmm. that all like I mean that's what you kind of look for when you go back and listen to something that you like. That's so like with other people's music, like you can, you can music that's really special. You can like list off those things of what, yeah, where am I when this is happening? Like you can, it's, it's a vivid kind of picture. Like you should Mm -hmm. uh, take a second maybe to think about that with your own writing, or I should think, I should take a second and think about that with my own writing, you know, like, (laughs) man. Hey Ken, thank you so much for hanging out with me this morning and and, and chatting. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And thanks so totally much for kicking cool. ass mixing our records, dude. <laughs> dude, my total pleasure. Um I still I'm still listening to Surviving at least once a week. It's like a kick ass record. My my son really digs it. Too. Oh cool. Thanks, yeah. man. Ha <laughs> ha! Ken Andrews, everybody. Again, it's sort of funny how you think that maybe technology and more education in the process of things is going to help you in some way. I I guess it does to a point, but really, man, it just comes down to doing the hard work of like, like we got into toward the end there of just like, you know, doing it. That's all it is, is doing it. You got to do it. (laughs) Again, summoning, summoning my, my inner Shia LaBeouf and, telling you you just got to do it (laughs) hum your scat track against your melody record that play it back figure out what you're trying to tell yourself and write lyrics to that there you go there's how to write a song (laughs) it's that easy everyone should do it of course it's really not that easy (laughs) or i'd be uh, yeah nothing special to announce just more of this. You know how it is. <laughs> 2020, you know how it is. More of this. Coming next week, more of this. <laughs>